Folks, tonight, our speaker, Ben yeah. Hutchins, he's going to tell us about a trip earlier this year to Guatemala. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about Ben. He's so pretty. Uh, <laughs> besides the fact he's pretty, um, he lives at 123 East Sierra Circle in San Marcos. <laughs> Party in the South. I don't like this. Uh, he's currently five feet six inches tall. He received his bachelor's degree at Western Kentucky University, where he also took two semesters of Japanese. Is this a Tinder profile? Or <laughs> he lies long, long, long. He started caving and he continues to do so while being actively involved in research on some things at Texas State University. Some mystery. Uh, he recently purchased a Roku and he intermittently uses it. And <laughs> Just one final quick fact about Ben, his taste in pickles is continually evolving. <laughs> 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 I was wondering if she was actually going to read that. <laughs> you know, I didn't until just tonight, and then I was like, well, okay, awesome. so it was there. Okay. <laughs> do I have a, do I get a clicker? Oh, do you get a clicker? Or, yes, or, sir, you do, but I don't know. It is plugged in. Okay. <laughs> I think the arrow is. Uh, He's got a laser pointer, too. Wait, there is also a You have to point it at the projector, and there's about a half a second delay. Oh, okay. Sorry, too much clicking. It's that one. Oh, guys, don't read me. This one. Oh, it's already on. That one. There we go. Woo! Alright. Click this one for me. Alright. So, so I'm going to be talking about our um, April trip. Uh oh, <laughs> not that one. <laughs> yes. Sweet. Beautiful. All right. So, did anybody see Ben Tobin give this presentation at NSS this year? No. Sweet. So it's new to everybody. That's that's what I was hoping for. Because he wasn't there, right? No, he, no, he was. He, that was his. I have stole that presentation um, and and put my name first. But otherwise, it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. That's good. All right. If you can't get it to be forward, I can help. Is it the oh. yellow arrow? Is it the yellow? It's the arrow. It should be the arrow. And the oh, at the projector. Yeah. Okay. We'll get this before the end. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so we've been going down here since 2013. Our caving area is in the Sierra de los Minas range, which is right here, right? So we're just south of, of Mexico. I'm sure we're going to be hearing an awesome presentation from like this area <laughs> before too long. Is it working? No? Let's see. Yeah, just give a sec. Oh, all right, I'll go ahead and do it. <laughs> okay. So, so since 2013, we have found about three kind of significant caves. The first one we found was Cueva Seca. I'll show you all some pictures of that later. It's about three kilometers of cave there. Um, oh, I got it. Oh. oh, okay. It's all yours. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I did, there were so many arrows on here. I didn't know uh, the other one uh, that we found more recently was called Oklaba Al Ha, that is basically means like where the water goes in. Right, so this is a, an insurgent's cave. It's about a kilometer and a half long. Um, really nice big passage. Uh, this is called the Rio Zarco. It's about, um, in the dry season when we're there, it's close to like 100 CFS. Um, so, so pretty cool stuff. We, we've known about this cave for a few years, um, but it's access to this cave is controlled by a town called Naran Hall. And Naran Hall is real kind of twitchy. Like some years they let us go in, some years they don't. So we knew about it, then they wouldn't let us in, and then they let us back in, and that was in uh, that was a couple years ago, and we mapped a bunch of caves. Actually, that was in 2018 that we mapped this cave, um, and so that was like a really good find in 2018. Uh, we also found what was called Windy Surprise Cave, 
Uh, so this was another about a kilometer and a half of, of cave, uh, also controlled by the town of Naran Hall. Uh, we found this near the end of the trip. Uh, this was also a cave that we had known about for a few years. Um, and we left in 2018 with a couple of like really nice, exciting leads. Um, so a beautiful passage. Yay. So we were pumped to get back in there. And so in 2018, we worked with Narn Hall. Uh, we, we bought them about $100 worth of cement because they had a spring box that was broken and they needed water for their town. So we did that for them. And they seemed so happy. Uh, they let us go caving every day. We paid our guides good. They let us park our vehicles in the schoolyard. Everything was cool. So we had good leads to come back to in 2019. And so that's what we were going to do. Um, this is kind of just an aerial image of where those caves are. Uh, so Oklahoma Hall, you can see the stream boop, 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 sinks here. Uh, there's, there's river here. Then there's this kind of this blank area that we can't really figure out what's going on. And then the river kind of comes back out up there. So hydrologically, these are all connected. Uh, windy surprise, Ventosa Sopressa, you can see goes right over top of Cueva Seca. It's about 100 meters above it. So we're like, oh, maybe we can connect these caves. That was one of our big uh, plans. Uh, so just to show you kind of what that looks like in profile. Not, you know, it's not a super deep system. You've got a couple hundred meters here. We do have higher caves up in the mountains, um, but we've not been able to get into those caves for, for, for years. Basically, if you've heard me talk about this caving area previously, the locals are, they just, I don't, you can't predict them. They don't, they don't like us to go there. So, we know. Do they speak, uh, are they particularly indigenous group? The, yes, so this whole area are the Kekchi Mayans. Um, and to their defense, they've had a really crappy time. Uh, basically, they have a huge palm plantation that took all of the kind of arable land, and then the mountain was designated as a national park. And so they've been pretty marginalized and they're kind of just like stuck in between the palm plantation where, which is like the only job in town, but it's a crappy job, and the mountains that they're not supposed to go to, but they're still trying to eke out a living. So go figure, they're a little bit weary when a bunch of like random white people come in and say, you know, take us to your natural resources. Um, and that's what we did. <laughs> um, we had a really good crew. This is the biggest crew we've ever had. So from Texas, we had uh, myself, Charlie Savis, and Jean. Uh, let's see. There is a, there's a, oh, yeah. Um, so Mike and Andrew Futrell from Virginia. Uh, Matt and Nancy, Matt Oliphant, Nancy Pistol, they're from California. They've been caving down in Guatemala since way before it was even safe to go to Guatemala. Uh, ben Tobin lives in Kentucky now. Philip uh, lives in a van. <laughs> lives a dream. Uh, Andrew used to live in a van. I think he lives in Colorado now. And, and then a lot of you all know uh, Philip Reichwalder, who's in Tennessee. And he always looks like that. <laughs> if you know Philip, that's 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 like that's him. <laughs> and Dean is always just like rocking it out. We got I've got some good pictures of Dean. Speaking of, so here's how our trips go. You fly into Guatemala City. Uh, the next morning, you go to Walmart, get all your stuff, get out of Guatemala City as fast as you can, and you make it as far as Lago Izabal. This is a big lake, a couple hours from our caving area. Uh, you stop. You get fried fish and like look at Jean's smirk. Like this was her plan. Like she insti instituted this tradition of, of fried fish. Um, guys, well, of course, beer. You guys, you guys rent cars or SUVs? Yeah. So so we rent. We typically rent like Hilux trucks. Um, we we have found that the trucks are really nice for hauling dirty cavers and gear back and forth between where we stay, which I'll show you in a minute, and in the actual caves. You don't really need four-wheel drive for the most part, unless it's just like raining a whole bunch. Otherwise, you could do it in two-wheel drive, um, but the trucks, the trucks are really nice. Uh, so Lago Izabal is, is really cool. It's a really big lake. Uh, you get manatees that swim up in there. Um, you can actually sail all the way up into Lago Izabal. It's a huge hurricane hole, so like people in Rio Dulce, which is a town on the coast, will sail up in here uh, for safety. Um, but 
we get out of there as quick as we can and head to ice cream. <laughs> so you can tell this was not Gene's plan. At this point, Gene's like, there's caves over there. Why are we here? Um, but Andrew has a more positive outlook on ice cream. <laughs> but this is part of the tradition. You go, you get ice cream, you talk to Letty. She tells us like what's going on as we, as we you know, scope things out. Uh, then we drive on to our field station. Um, the field station used to be a lot bigger. You can see like the, um, the, the foundation here. It used to have a, a thatched roof. They didn't, they didn't take care of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ron almost knocked down the old, what was left of the old place. But they rebuilt it. And you can see that they've got a tin roof now. So it's really nice inside. Uh, screened in. It's so hot. It's very hot, but... But it's, it's, a, it's a really nice place. they got running water. Um, you can take cold showers. We've got a kitchen. Uh, what are those? Yeah, we, we did really good on oranges this year. And I don't know why we hung the coffee. <laughs> the rest makes sense. You've got rodents and stuff. You want to know? I don't know. We did really good on bananas. And we did really good, we did really good on hot sauce. So like, if you can see, there's like, this whole section here is all hot sauce. <laughs> so I spent like a day, this meticulous like meal plan. Okay, we need this many calories of all this stuff. And everyone's like, we need more hot sauce. <laughs> That's fine. Um, yeah, it's a great place to do, you know, it's a, it's a great field station. Um, that very first day, we actually did get some folks underground to just like mop up some small leads in Cueva Seca. Um, while they were doing that, we went back to Neuron Hall to say hi to everybody and just kind of, you know, grease the wheels for what we thought was going to be an awesome week of caving. This was just kind of, you know, we just thought we had to get this as a formality. We, we left on such great, you know, on, on great terms in 2018. So we came back, showing a picture, showing a big, big map. A few of you all have heard me try to talk Spanish. Like, Nancy is, is thinking right now. Nancy's like, I can't understand a word that he's saying. Just a on her face. Yeah, yeah, she's being kind, but she's not. <laughs> yeah, I'm not good. Um, but anyway, how did that go? Well, there, there are three things in this picture to show you how that went. Uh, first, my face gives it away. Two, if you, if you all know Mike and Andrew Futrell, they are like, survey addicts. They're junkies. The fact that it's light outside and they're not underground is a real bad sign. And then it's like day one of the expedition and our, and our like rum bottle is almost empty. Um, and so because Naran Hall said that when we went last year, even though you know we helped them build their spring box, they said, well, you went in the cave and that made our springs dry up. Oh. Uh, not sure how that happens. So we had a couple of, we actually had uh, several Guatemalan cavers with us as well, and after like a day or two of, of kind of like pushing them, comes to find out everybody's just paranoid that we are stealing gold from their caves. That is a, that is a, perennial. that is a perennial problem in Guatemala that we've had to deal with. Um, yeah, I mean. An empty bottle of liquor on day one? Exactly, yeah. It's not totally empty. There's a little, there's some dregs left in there. Is that a local? Uh, who was it that was making those those highly drinkable rum drinks? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> I think I could guess, yeah. Ben, is that guy a local? Or is that one of your... Clients? Yeah, no, he's a local. Uh, and man, that guy. I don't even, I won't even start on that guy. <laughs> He's always just like slinking around in the background. This is him. He's fine. He's cool. So, all right. So we have this big crew. We have all these these big high leads that we're going to, and all of a sudden we've lost access. So we say, well, you know, okay, if we can't get into our, our cave, we'll get into it from the bottom up. So the next day we kind of, you know, I guess, recover from the hangover and decide, okay, let's go to Cueva Seca and we'll just start going up from the bottom. Uh, luckily on this crew we had some awesome climbers, um, and so they did some awesome stuff. This is the hike up to Cueva Seca. It's about, you drive over and then you walk up the, the, the kind of dry stream bed. It's, I don't know, maybe half hour to get to the cave entrance. Really nice cave entrance. This is a big overflow spring, so in the wet season, water in the cave rises up like 30 or 40 meters and pours and out this in the And sometimes in the, yeah, sometimes in the dry season. Yeah, yeah, so, so 
Yeah, so Ron has seen years where we go here in the dry season, which is typically like March, April, and there's water pouring out of this entrance and there's just no caving to be had. It's a bummer. Uh, this year, the weather cooperated. You go into the cave uh, about, a, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes in, you hit uh, that river again, the Rio Zarco. Um, it gets, you know, it gets fun. There's some swimming parts and, and fast water, but nothing too crazy. And then we started going up. So this is why we map caves, all right? So because we had line plots and because we had cave maps, we could look at ceiling heights, we could look at passage morphology, and we could say, go up right here. This is, if there's gonna be a connection, this is where it's gonna be. So Andrew Chandler, uh, he started leading this, this climb, which became known as the Richard McNair climb. That's, that's like a conglomeration of people's middle names. I, I wasn't there when that happened, but it is. Um, it took, Gene, how, was it two days? Two or three, it, it took him a while. It, this climb was, it was a significant climb. I'll come back to it. Um, while, while Andrew was leading that, uh, Matt Oliphant was leading a climb at the very back of the cave. This became known as the Zapway because it was a continuation of a climb that Matt Zapatello started with me a couple of years ago. You, you finished it? Well, we what kept going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so where we left it was like the 17 meter high overhung flowstone thing. All the climbs in here are on flowstone. This whole expedition was like climbing up flowstone, which is, I, I guess it was okay, but not ideal. Um, so he worked that. So while the climbers were going up, uh, we managed to do a few other things. So basically kind of like checking off mop-up leads. This one actually resulted in like half a kilometer of survey, 10 minutes from the entrance of the cave that we had just blown past for years. Um, it ends in, in flowstone. This, this cave has a big flowstone problem. Uh, yeah. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. I don't like it. But you know, half a kilometer of, of survey is pretty good. Uh, this was another passage that was totally written off. It was like this little crawly lead under flowstone. Uh, they assumed it was just kind of a little room under the flowstone, but it led to at least a, a few hundred meters of survey and some pretty reasonable passage uh, before, it, before it sunk. So we were keeping our teams busy, and that was the important thing. So even though we had these like awesome leads that we were hoping to get to and we weren't getting to them, we had enough that it was still being productive. Is that daylight coming in? No. Uh, no, no. This is this is probably an hour and a half into the cave. Yeah, uh, and then of course you go back and you get under your mosquito nets and enter data at night. Uh, Gene used that opportunity to get some cool bug pics. All the fauna in here is probably undescribed, so we're actually on the other side of a tectonic plate boundary from all of the other limestone and all of the, bi the, the cave biology that's been done in the country. We're on the other side of that continental plate margin. So these are probably on the, we've not been able to get permits to collect, but like, man, look at that spider. That's cool. Uh, so this is, so after, after Andrew worked the Richard McNair climb, he climbed up about 100 meters uh, when it was cleaned up, I think it was like three rebelays right off, right off, you know, like your belayer is standing in the river, which was kind of weird. But eventually they got, it started going horizontal and they rigged this, this, this kind of, this long traverse that, that uh, went out into this cool thing where Philip Reichwaller and I had stood like the year before. So this was it. We had tied in. Um, so we made the connection. They made the connection. Uh, the climbers get like all the credit for this. Um, this hadn't been surveyed, it had been scooped, but, but we surveyed it, and hey, there, there is worse scoop passage to survey, it's pretty good, right? Um, yeah, so, so basically once they, once they got to where we were, then they started surveying in what was called Swan Lake. So even though you're like 100 meters up above the river, that flowstone problem, this flowstone like makes these giant pools. This pool is, is a couple hundred meters long. It's way over your head you know, in terms of how deep it is. And it should have been called Flamingo Lake. <laughs> <laughs> we thought, when we were in Walmart and we saw this, we were like, oh, this is good. We need this to get across the lake. Like, obviously, that's going to be really useful for traveling. <laughs> um, it was not at all um, good. 
Yeah. So Philip Reichwalder figured out the best way to, to navigate, the, to drive the flamingo, is to lay on your stomach backwards so that your legs are straddling the neck of the flamingo and you're paddling butt first. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do that a lot. So. Um, but it was cool that we, that we made this connection, which was like one of the big goals of the expedition. It just took us a lot longer to do because we were doing it from the bottom up. Uh, whoops. Oops. Okay, we can't go backwards. All right. That's fine. Um, so. Is that backwards for you? No, this is. Uh, go back one more. I don't. Oh, oh, never mind. Yeah, we're done with that. <laughs> okay, so Andrew, you know, he he just done this like 100 meter climb up Flowstone, and he's like, now what do we do? Let's keep going up. And so he tackled what became call, uh, known as the Level 3 Express. You know, it looks like a big climb. And it's not just Flowstone, but it's like muddy Flowstone, right? I mean, you look at like Tobin is all slopped down here. But, you know, Andrew was, he was a. Uh, Andrew's a good climber. He, he knew what he's doing. Uh, unfortunately, this didn't really go very far. It went up another, I forget, 40 or 50 meters maybe, and then, and then leveled out, and then the flowstone just killed the lead. While that was going on, um, Matt Oliphant had gotten to the top of the Zapway, and it went back down into a big, like, going canyon. There was another, uh, another lake there, what we call Dripstone Lake, uh, we got several hundred meters there before the level that we were on became too tight. Uh, we ended that lead in like this little hole that was just going like with the wind coming out of it. Um, but there are some big high leads up above it too. So, so the Zapway does continue, but it's not like going past it. There's going to be more climbing if we want to hit that or, or explosives. One or two. Yeah, what kind of climbing are they doing? They are doing, <laughs> so we did not plan this expedition to be a big up effort. So they were, I think, getting pretty creative with what they were using. They were definitely setting some bolts. Um, they were trying to be minimal on bolt setting. They had, they were rigging like dynamic rope at the end of this thing because we had run out of like rope pieces. I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a climber, so I don't know what they were doing, but. I mean, he was definitely, it was pretty epic. The climbs that they did were, were pretty badass, really. Um, so, all right, so after all is said and done, we tied the two caves together, um, this, so it became Sistema Zarco, so it has four entrances now. Um, the new stuff, so all of this back here is new, this is what was beyond the Zapway, this was the Level 3 Express, the connection area was kind of in this mess right here. Um, this was new, this was new, most of this stuff is new. This was one of our big leads, it became, it was called Adventure Time. Um, it eventually leads to another entrance that has been, that has not been surveyed yet. It got really hairy as well in terms of, you know, it's not a super vertical cave, but there's just a ton of up and down. So you probably can't see the resolution is not high enough, but like all of these, these little numbers are all rig pitches. So you got like three rig pitches back here. This is like a 30 meter pitch, a 30, Two meter pitch. These are all rig pitches here. So there's a lot of just going up and down. You climb up and over a lot of that flowstone crap. Um, but you know, it's pretty pretty successful. And the other really cool thing is that that lead in the Zapway, if you can see up here in the profile, is getting pretty close to the other cave, Oklahoma Hall. So it's only about 200 meters horizontal distance to connect there. And, and it's and it's still really big passage. It's just the connection is going to be up high, and it'd be much easier probably to connect from this cave if we can ever get access again. So that wouldn't add any depth to the system, but it would give it another entrance, and just be, <coughs> it'd, make it, it'd be really cool to make that connection as well. Did the locals find out that you guys actually went in? Um, you know, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't so think we, I, still, And still no access to Puebla Seca Arriba? Arriba. Uh, okay, let's talk about Cueva Seca Arriba. Right. 
So let me see here. All right. So we're all in this big limestone plateau, right? And so we're down at like two, three hundred meters. The limestone plateau in this area goes up to like five hundred plus meters. Um, and we know that there's big caves up there because we've been to them. But there's an illegal squatter village up there on the mountain that doesn't, and they are camped right on the cave entrance, which is Cueva Seca Arriba that, that Ron was asking about. If we could ever get into that cave, it would go down at a lot of depth and, and just blow open the system. I have no doubt about it. Uh, they still said no, so we did do our annual pilgrimage up to the squatter village to ask for permission and get denied and turn around and go back. We've done that a couple times now. Um, but we have another way up there now that is on friendly territory. We didn't know this existed. Um, so we did do a couple of trips up high onto the plateau. There are actually pretty nice trails up there. Um, the forest is it's, it's pretty pretty awesome forest. The trails. Are the trails something the people there use? The people they? use these trails. They mainly are growing cardamom up on the slopes. Oh wow. Um, so yeah, so these are squatting? local, what's that? Are they squatting to grow the cardamom? I mean, all of this is in a national park, so the cardamom is technically illegal. Oh. Um, and so what you do, is you got a couple of things. So it is a park. It is supposed to be a park. It's a paper park. Yeah. Okay. So you've got, you've got villages down below that will do, that have these trails that go up to their, to their fields that they tend, mm -hmm. and then they go back down in the evenings. When one of those villages becomes too crowded, people will split off and so the squatter village is actually derived from another unfriendly town that we've visited where a bunch of people left they went up top they cleared a big flat area and now they're living there they, it's like they're budding it's like the villages are, are parthenogenic um, so the trails are a combination of like travel trails and also the people that live up there uh, and eventually as you get deeper in the trails kind of dissipate and you get into this really gnarly karst that's really difficult uh, to navigate through. Um, but in this area where we were allowed to go, they did find a number of caves. Oh, and the people, they're, they're cutting it down as quick as they can. So that makes it a lot easier to find caves, but... So like they watched, our group watched it, I think this tree they cut down, like, I mean, it's... Like this clearing was not there last year. No, this is for, it's for farming. It's for corn and, corn and cardamom. Corn and, corn and cardamom. Yeah. Um, we found a bunch of caves. None of them, none of them went, unfortunately. Um, you know, things like this are just all over the place. I think they mapped like 17 features. <coughs> a, a nine or 10 of them are caves. We, we surveyed two of them. I thought this one was gonna go. It really had the feel of something that was going. It was moving a little bit of air. It, it ends in like diggable breakdown, but it's not like move a few rocks and go. I mean, it's, it's, it's a project up there. Yeah, I mean, I think that we know that there are open caves up there, so I think that we're not to the point of trying to dig into the, the system yet. Uh, this was another one called Fat Happy Amblypidgeon Cave that was <laughs> maybe 30 meters deep or something. I can't remember. I didn't go in this one. Um, so there are lots of caves up there, but these were not the caves we were looking for. Tell us about the namesake. Uh, Jean, do you know the namesake on that one? I have no idea. Oh, I thought you were in this one. Uh, happy Amble Pigeon. Oh, yeah, I was there. Okay. I mean, I can picture it. There was some fat Happy Amble Pigeons in there. <laughs> yeah, makes perfect sense. The biology is actually really nice in this area. Um, I was working for 2020 with some biologists to try to get permits to do some collections because we've never done any collections. I'll get back to that momentarily. I'm almost finished. Um, so anyway, this kind of shows you what's going on. So this white polygon, that's basically the limestone. So all our big caves are just at the little corner here. Like we haven't even touched this thing yet. And the, and the limestone actually kind of slopes up. So it's like four or 500 meters vertical extent here. It's over a kilometer. This is like 17, the high point is like 1,700 meters above sea level. And sea level is like right here. So. The, these big lines, these are all drainages that, that sink in blind valleys. So this is a big sinkhole. This is a big sinkhole where we know there's a cave. This is where Cueva Seca Arriba is. So if we could get in here, like all oh, this is cave, we know it. And this is another one here. But the problem is the road goes this way, and so all of these villages have like staked out their property. 
right? And so all of these villagers are like, no, 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 you can't go. <laughs> um, our only friendly village is like right here, and so they own like this stretch, so you have to do that. Um, and how far down inward did the stretches go? Did they go all the way to that outer boundary of limestone? Oh, like over here? Yeah. So no, they don't. Okay. And so that's one thing we're considering, something that we've never tried is coming in from this side. So there's another road over here, and so you can see, like, this is all clear cutting, right? And the clear cutting actually goes up into this drainage. So people can get here. Like, farmers are in there. We don't know if the people that are in here are coming from this way or they're coming from this way. But one of the things we might try is to spend a day or two down here talking to folks. There's a road that goes up to, like, about here, you know, and then it's just a couple of kilometers to hike. You probably have to, like, do a big roundabout hike to get up there. But that's what we're thinking we might try next year. While you're on this map, what does the park boundary look like, more or less? Uh, yeah, so the park boundary is, is basically starts at the, at the scarp face, which is so more or less like here. So anything that's going on up in here is all on the park. I don't know how far this way it goes, and on this side it goes... It was almost that other road. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's like in here somewhere. So like all of that stuff is So most there. of the limestone area. All the limestone, there. all of the limestone is in the park. Yeah. So yeah, so to date we have actually found 14 caves. Uh, we have nine additional entrances that we don't have survey in yet. The big system is seven kilometers long, 234 meters deep. Uh, we've got about 10 kilometers of survey in the whole system. The vast majority of that is in those two caves. How many years? We started this project, kind, our, we did like a three-day recon trip, my wife and I, in 2013. So the first real caving trip was in 2014. So our survey, like, length per year is actually not very good. But that's because some of, yeah, some of those years we go and, like, it's raining and they won't let us in, or the palm plantation is closed. Like, we have left here with zero footage yeah. in some years. But, yeah, yeah, we go other places. Luckily, there's a ton of limestone in Guatemala, so there's lots to do. But yeah, I mean, if we could get access to these things, like, there's, a, there's, a, there's an awesome system here. Definitely the longest, deepest cave in Guatemala, if we could get into it. <laughs> <laughs> no Prove me wrong. <laughs> All right, so postscript. So, so a few months ago, <laughs> Because access in this area is, is not a pain in the ass enough as it is, um, a few months ago, on the other side of the, of the lake, three federal soldiers got killed with a, in a shootout with uh, narco traffickers. Um, Wait, that, that's all in Mexico, though. <laughs> <laughs> we need a wall. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> and that's the end of my talk. <laughs> uh, so, so that happened, and the president, the outgoing president, declared a state of seas on like this huge area, including our our area. So, what, what does that mean? It, it means there's limits on travel, freedom of speech, a couple of other rights. And then, about a few weeks after that state of siege happened. All of these local and federal officers descended on a little town called Rio Samoy Dos, which is about a mile from our from Salampin. Like this is like the, where we stay, they play soccer in this soccer field. Like there's our there's the mountain right there. Um, and so they arrested three people associated with that shootout. Um, we have no clue what this means in terms of access. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's bad. Probably it doesn't matter. I don't know. But every year it's something, and so who knows what this means for us. Um, but it was, uh, it was pretty crazy that that's going on down there. So um, We had always felt very safe in this area. We had never seen any indication of, of any kind of organized crime. Um, and there's, there's a lot of debate about, like, are these people just patsies? Like, did they actually have anything to do with it? Um, we'll see how this plays out, but it's, it's playing out right now. Um, so, there may be a 2020 trip, there may not be, we'll see. But it's a cool place, and if there is, you all should go with us. So, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Ben, did you take Chuck Norris on this trip? <laughs>
<laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Was there somebody that looked like Chuck Norris in there? Don't you remember when I went on that trip, all those kids were swarming around me? Oh, Chuck, Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. So, like, are they, do they remember you year to year? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, are they like, oh, you guys again? Yeah. Please. <laughs> so uh, actually on the bright side of that, one of the day one of the days that we were hiking up the mountain to, to our safe spot, one of the guys from the squatter village was coming down the mountain in the other direction. We passed him and we were like, you and we remember when we had had this meeting in the town the previous year, this was the guy that was like blah 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 Donald Trump, blah 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 black helicopters, blah 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 like he was like the most vocal anti, like, you guys, we can't come to your country, why can't you come to our country? Like, he was mad. But we had this really, we were in an informal setting just on the trail, like not, you know, not in the, the community, and just got to talking to him, and he's like, yeah, we don't have any water up there, it's really hard, what are you doing, why are you keep coming? Like, you know, we were actually able to kind of have a conversation. I remember Gene being, I don't remember what he was saying, but I remember you saying, that's not true. <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, it's not. Um, but you know, like if things can change, right? Yeah. You never know from one year to the next. We've seen groups go from friendly to not friendly, and vice versa. And so, like, we're going to keep going up there. We're debating, like, okay, do we help these people? Yeah. I mean, they're squatters. They shouldn't be there. They're they're cutting down beautiful rainforest, but they also like. If we want to be up there and enjoying it, like, do we? Is that do we work with them? Well, I can see, like, uh, like, you know, there's definitely social complexities there because, like, yes, they're squatters, but if they're from the village in the area, like, some would say maybe they have more right to squat on that rainforest than you don't have to fly down and go in the caves, right? So, it's, yeah, I can see it's just really complicated. I mean, yeah, they're, they've got, like, nothing. Yeah. I can't, you can't blame them for being up there. Yeah. They've got, like, no other thing to do. It's just as frustrating. It's like, you do your thing, let us do our thing. Because yeah. we, we were there first. We were. They weren't there. <laughs> we went there when it was pristine rainforest. <laughs> and then the squatter village was there two years later. <laughs> That's not a good argument. I won't use it. <laughs> we'll, we'll edit that out. <laughs> How are you going to get the gold in? Yeah. <laughs> Man, I, so we have all kinds. So one year, they were like, do you all find that? that liquid in the cave and we're like water no the liquid that you sell like oil no like, no it's like blue and it's orange and it's green and they're like I, we have no idea what you're talking about like what do you what do you do with it like, you sell it like, for what like, i don't know but it's worth a lot and i started looking around and it's like i had a blue analogy or i had blue Gatorade powder, somebody else had red Gatorade powder, and someone else had, like, they are, they're, I mean, granted, like, they have nothing, and, like, everything they did have was taken from them. It's so crazy, I mean, like, so we have that in China, where it's just, like, so outside of their culture, that you would fly to another country to just, like, fall in a hole, yeah. to, like, ruin your clothes and be dirty. It's gotta be, it's gotta be. Like, I mean, it is super bizarre, like, when we get the Called on us, I'd be like, of course, because we are doing super weird things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah when you're and, I, and I have like this whole moral conundrum like, maybe we just lie and be like, yeah, there's gold. We know it's there. We haven't found it yet, but let us in and I'll share it with you. <laughs> 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 Yeah, you're on the you're you're right on these two huge um, yeah yeah shoe zones that are are, are plate boundaries. Yeah, so most of the Sierra de los Pinos is not limestone. It's just a little patch of limestone. Then you got all of these. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's the mountain of the mines, Sierra de los Pinos, because it's been a long history of yeah. extraction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So mine's not a question, so I'll give first six to questions first. Any final questions? I have a belated announcement, but great presentation. <laughs> <laughs>